Sufism, or Tasawwuf Arabic, Al-Tasawwuf personal noun, Sufi Sufi I, Sufi, Mutasawif Mutasawif, variously defined as, "...Islamic mysticism", the inward dimension of Islam, or, "...the phenomenon of mysticism within Islam", is mysticism in Islam, "...characterized by particular values, ritual practices, doctrines and institutions." which began very early in Islamic history and represents the main manifestation and the most important and central crystallization of mystical practice in Islam. Practitioners of Sufism have been referred to as Sufis. Arabic plurals, Sufiatsriya, Sufiwan Sufiyan, Mutasawufat Mutasawwifa, Mutasawufun Mutasawwifun, it has also been described as having preceded and inspired all religion. Historically, Sufis have often belonged to different turuk, or orders. Congregations formed around a grand master referred to as a wali who traces a direct chain of successive teachers back to the Islamic prophet, Muhammad. These orders meet for spiritual sessions majalis in meeting places known as zawiyas, kankas or tekka. They strive for asan perfection of worship, as detailed in a hadith. Asan is to worship Allah as if you see him, if you can't see him, surely he sees you." Sufis regard Muhammad as al-Insan al-Kamal, the primary perfect man who exemplifies the morality of God, and see him as their leader and prime spiritual guide. All Sufi orders trace most of their original precepts from Muhammad through his cousin and son-in-law Ali, with the notable exception of one. Although the overwhelming majority of Sufis, both pre-modern and modern, were and are adherents of Sunni Islam, there also developed certain strands of Sufi practice within the ambit of Shia Islam during the late medieval period. Although Sufis were opposed to dry legalism, they strictly observed Islamic law and belonged to various schools of Islamic jurisprudence and theology. Sufis have been characterized by their asceticism, especially by their attachment to Dhikr, the practice of remembrance of God, often performed after prayers. They gained adherence among a number of Muslims as a reaction against the worldliness of the early Umayyad Caliphate. 661 and have spanned several continents and cultures over a millennium, initially expressing their beliefs in Arabic and later expanding into Persian, Turkish, and Urdu, among others. Sufis played an important role in the formation of Muslim societies through their missionary and educational activities. According to William Chittick, in a broad sense, Sufism can be described as the interiorization, and intensification of Islamic faith and practice. Topic. Terminology According to William Chittick the term Sufism came into being not by Islamic texts or Sufis themselves but by British Orientalists who wanted to create an artificial divide between what they found attractive in Islamic civilization i.e. Islamic spirituality and the negative stereotypes that were present in Britain about Islam. These British Orientalists, therefore, fabricated a divide that was previously non existent. Historically, Muslims have used the originally Arabic word tasawwuf to identify the practice of Sufis. Mainstream scholars of Islam define tasawwuf or Sufism as the name for the inner or esoteric dimension of Islam, which is supported and complemented by outward or exoteric practices of Islam, such as sharia. In this view, it is absolutely necessary to be a Muslim to be a true Sufi, because Sufism's methods are inoperative without Muslim affiliation. However, Islamic scholars themselves are not by any means in agreement about the meaning of the word Sufi. Sufis themselves claim that tasawwuf is an aspect of Islam similar to Sharia, inseparable from Islam and an integral part of Islamic belief and practice. Classical Sufi scholars have defined tasawwuf as a science whose objective is the reparation of the heart and turning it away from all else but God." Traditional Sufis such as Bayazid Bastami, Rumi, Haji Bektashvili, Junarid of Baghdad, Al-Ghazali, and Sayyid Ali Hamadani, define Sufism as purely based upon the tenets of Islam and the teachings of Muhammad. Etymology <inaudible> 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 The original meaning of Sufi seems to have been, "...one who wears wool suf", and the Encyclopedia of Islam calls other etymological hypotheses, "...untenable". 
Woolen clothes were traditionally associated with ascetics and mystics. Al Kushari and Ibn Khaldun both rejected all possibilities other than Saf on linguistic grounds. Another explanation traces the lexical root of the word to Safa, Sfar, which in Arabic means purity. These two explanations were combined by the Sufi al Rudabari, d. 322R, who said, The Sufi is the one who wears wool on top of purity. Others have suggested that the word comes from the term Ahl as Safa, the people of the bench who were a group of impoverished companions of Muhammad who held regular gatherings of Dhikr. These men and women who sat at al-Masjid and Nabawi are considered by some to be the first Sufis. The term Sufism could also be a neologism of German origin coined by August Tholuck in his first book Sufismus, Sive Theosophia Passarum Pantheistica, published in Latin in Berlin in 1821. History Topic <inaudible> <inaudible> Origins According to Carl W. Ernst, the earliest figures of Sufism are Muhammad himself and his companions. Sahaba. Sufi orders are based on the Bayah, Bayat Bayah, Mubayat Mubayra, pledge, allegiance, that was given to Muhammad by his Sahaba. By pledging allegiance to Muhammad, the Sahaba had committed themselves to the service of God. According to Islamic belief, by pledging allegiance to Muhammad, the Sahaba pledged allegiance to God. Verily, those who give bayah pledge to you, O Muhammad, they are giving bayah pledge to Allah. The hand of Allah is over their hands. Then whosoever breaks his pledge, breaks it only to his own harm, and whosoever fulfills what he has covenanted with Allah, he will bestow on him a great reward. Translation of Quran, 48-10 Sufis believe that by giving bayah pledging allegiance to a legitimate Sufi sheikh, one is pledging allegiance to Muhammad, therefore, a spiritual connection between the seeker and Muhammad is established. It is through Muhammad that Sufis aim to learn about, understand and connect with God. Ali is regarded as one of the major figures amongst the Sahaba who have directly pledged allegiance to Muhammad, and Sufis maintain that through Ali, knowledge about Muhammad and a connection with Muhammad may be attained. Such a concept may be understood by the Hadith, which Sufis regard to be authentic, in which Muhammad said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. Eminent Sufis such as Ali Hujwiri refer to Ali as having a very high ranking in Tasawwuf. Furthermore, Junarid of Baghdad regarded Ali as sheikh of the principles and practices of Tasawwuf. Historian Jonathan A. C. Brown notes that during the lifetime of Muhammad, some companions were more inclined than others to intensive devotion, pious abstemiousness, and pondering the divine mysteries more than Islam required, such as Abu Dhar al Ghifari. Hassan al Basri, a tabi, is considered a founding figure in the science of purifying the heart. Practitioners of Sufism hold that in its early stages of development Sufism effectively referred to nothing more than the internalization of Islam. According to one perspective, it is directly from the Quran, constantly recited, meditated, and experienced, that Sufism proceeded, in its origin and its development. Other practitioners have held that Sufism is the strict emulation of the way of Muhammad, through which the heart's connection to the divine is strengthened. Modern academics and scholars have rejected early Orientalist theories asserting a non Islamic origin of Sufism. The consensus is that it emerged in Western Asia. Many have asserted Sufism to be unique within the confines of the Islamic religion, and contend that Sufism developed from people like Bayazid Bastami, who, in his utmost reverence to the Sunnah, refused to eat a watermelon because he did not find any proof that Muhammad ever ate it. According to the late medieval mystic Jamie, Abd Allah ibn Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya died c. 716, was the first person to be called a Sufi. Important contributions in writing are attributed to Uwais al-Nurani, Hassan of Basra, Harith al-Mahasibi, Abu Nasr as Saraj and Said ibn al-Musayib. Ruwaym, from the second generation of Sufis in Baghdad, was also an influential early figure, as was Junarid of Baghdad. A number of early practitioners of Sufism were disciples of one of the two. Sufism had a long history already before the subsequent institutionalization of Sufi teachings into devotional orders in the early Middle Ages. 
The Naqshbandi order is a notable exception to general rule of orders tracing their spiritual lineage through Muhammad's grandsons, as it traces the origin of its teachings from Muhammad to the first Islamic caliph, Abu Bakr. Over the years, Sufi orders have influenced and been adopted by various Shi movements, especially Ismailism, which led to the Safavir order's conversion to Shia Islam from Sunni Islam and the spread of Twelverism throughout Iran. Sufi orders include Bar Alawiya, Badawiya, Bektashi, Burhanya, Chishti, Kalwati, Mevlevi, Naqshbandi, Nimatullahi, Uyc, Qadiriya, Kalandariya, Rifri, Sawari Qadiri, Shadhiliya, Surawardiya, Tijaniya, Zinda Shah Madariya, and others. As an Islamic discipline Existing in both Sunni and Shia Islam, Sufism is not a distinct sect, as is sometimes erroneously assumed, but a method of approaching or a way of understanding the religion, which strives to take the regular practice of the religion to the supererogatory level, through simultaneously fulfilling the obligatory religious duties, and finding a way and a means of striking a route through the narrow gate in the depth of the soul out into the domain of the pure arid unimprisonable spirit which itself opens out onto the divinity." Academic studies of Sufism confirm that Sufism, as a separate tradition from Islam apart from so-called pure Islam, is frequently a product of Western Orientalism and modern Islamic fundamentalists. As a mystic and ascetic aspect of Islam, it is considered as the part of Islamic teaching that deals with the purification of the inner self. By focusing on the more spiritual aspects of religion, Sufis strive to obtain direct experience of God by making use of intuitive and emotional faculties that one must be trained to use. Tasawwuf is regarded as a science of the soul that has always been an integral part of Orthodox Islam. In his al rijala al safadiyya Ibn Taymiyyah describes the Sufis as those who belong to the path of the Sunnah and represented in their teachings and writings. Ibn Taymiyyah's Sufi inclinations and his reverence for Sufis like Abdul Qadir Gilani can also be seen in his hundred-page commentary on Futta al-Ghayb, covering only five of the 78 sermons of the book, but showing that he considered tasawwuf essential within the life of the Islamic community. In his commentary, Ibn Taymiyyah stresses that the primacy of the Sharia forms the soundest tradition in Tasawwuf, and to argue this point he lists over a dozen early masters, as well as more contemporary sheikhs like his fellow Hanbalis, al-Ansari al-Harawi and Abdul Qadir, and the latter's own sheikh, Hamad al-Dabbas the Upright. He cites the early sheikhs such as al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, Ibrahim ibn Adam, Ma'baq-Ruf al-Khaki, Siri Sakti, Junaid of Baghdad, and others of the early teachers, as well as Abdul Qadir Gilani, Hamad, Abu al-Bayan and others of the later masters—that they do not permit the followers of the Sufi path to depart from the divinely legislated command and prohibition. Al-Ghazali narrates in al munki min al-Dalal, the vicissitudes of life, family affairs and financial constraints engulfed my life and deprived me of the congenial solitude. The heavy odds confronted me and provided me with few moments for my pursuits. This state of affairs lasted for ten years, but whenever I had some spare and congenial moments I resorted to my intrinsic proclivity. During these turbulent years, numerous astonishing and indescribable secrets of life were unveiled to me. I was convinced that the group of Aulia holy mystics is the only truthful group who follow the right path, display best conduct and surpass all sages in their wisdom and insight. They derive all their overt or covert behavior from the illumining guidance of the holy prophet, the only guidance worth quest and pursuit. Topic: <laughs> Formalization of doctrine. In the 11th century, Sufism, which had previously been a less «codified» trend in Islamic piety, began to be «ordered and crystallized» into orders which have continued until the present day. All these orders were founded by a major Islamic scholar, and some of the largest and most widespread included the Qadiriyya after Abdul Qadir Gilani d. 1166, the Rifriya after Ahmed al rifri d. 1182, the Chishshiya after Moinuddin Chishti d. 1236, the Shadiliya after Abul Hasan ash Shadhili d. 1258, the Hamadaniya after Sayyid Ali Hamadani d. 1384, the Naqshbandiya after Baha Uddin Naqshband Bukhari d. 1389. 
Contrary to popular perception in the West, however, neither the founders of these orders nor their followers ever considered themselves to be anything other than Orthodox Sunni Muslims, and in fact all of these orders were attached to one of the four Orthodox legal schools of Sunni Islam. Thus, the Qadiriya order was Hanbali, with its founder, Abdul Qadir Gilani, being a renowned jurist, the Chizshia was Hanafi, the Shadliya order was Maliki, and the Naqshbandiya order was Hanafi. Thus, it is precisely because it is historically proven that, "...many of the most eminent defenders of Islamic orthodoxy, such as Abdul Qadir Gilani, Ghazali, and the Sultan Salah ad-Din Saladin were connected with Sufism." That the popular studies of writers like Idris Shah are continuously disregarded by scholars as conveying the fallacious image that Sufism is somehow distinct from Islam. Towards the end of the first millennium, a number of manuals began to be written summarizing the doctrines of Sufism and describing some typical Sufi practices. Two of the most famous of these are now available in English translation, the Kash al-Majab of Ali Hujwiri and the Rijala of al-Kushari. Two of al-Ghazali's greatest treatises are the revival of religious sciences and what he termed, its essence, the Kimiya yi Sa'adat. He argued that Sufism originated from the Quran and thus was compatible with mainstream Islamic thought and did not in any way contradict Islamic law—being instead necessary to its complete fulfillment. Ongoing efforts by both traditionally trained Muslim scholars and Western academics are making Al-Ghazali's works more widely available in English translation, allowing English-speaking readers to judge for themselves the compatibility of Islamic law and Sufi doctrine. Several sections of the revival of religious sciences have been published in translation by the Islamic Text Society. An abridged translation from an Urdu translation of The Alchemy of Happiness was published by Claude Field ISBN 9780935782288 in 1910. It has been translated in full by Muhammad Azam Bilal 2001. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Growth of Influence. Historically, Sufism became an incredibly important part of Islam", and "...one of the most widespread and omnipresent aspects of Muslim life." In Islamic civilization from the early medieval period onwards, when it began to permeate nearly all major aspects of Sunni Islamic life in regions stretching from India and Iraq to the Balkans and Senegal, the rise of Islamic civilization coincides strongly with the spread of Sufi philosophy in Islam. The spread of Sufism has been considered a definitive factor in the spread of Islam, and in the creation of integrally Islamic cultures, especially in Africa and Asia. The Senussi tribes of Libya and the Sudan are one of the strongest adherents of Sufism. Sufi poets and philosophers such as Koya Ahmet Yasawi, Rumi, and Attar of Nishapur c. 1145 c. 1221 greatly enhanced the spread of Islamic culture in Anatolia, Central Asia, and South Asia. Sufism also played a role in creating and propagating the culture of the Ottoman world, and in resisting European imperialism in North Africa and South Asia. Between the 13th and 16th centuries, Sufism produced a flourishing intellectual culture throughout the Islamic world, a golden age, whose physical artifacts survive. In many places, a person or group would endow a waqf to maintain a lodge, known variously as a zawiya, kankar, or teka, to provide a gathering place for Sufi adepts, as well as lodging for itinerant seekers of knowledge. The same system of endowments could also pay for a complex of buildings, such as that surrounding the Suleymaniyya Mosque in Istanbul, including a lodge for Sufi seekers, a hospice with kitchens where these seekers could serve the poor and/or complete a period of initiation, a library, and other structures. No important domain in the civilization of Islam remained unaffected by Sufism in this period. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Present. Sufism continued to remain a crucial part of daily Islamic life until the 20th century, when its historical influence upon Islamic civilization began to be undermined by modernism as well as be combated by the rise of Salafism and Wahhabism. Islamic scholar Timothy Winter has remarked, in classical, mainstream, medieval Sunni Islam, the idea of orthodox Islam would not have been possible without Sufism, and that the classical belief in Sufism being an essential component of Islam only weakened in some quarters of the Islamic world. 
a generation or two ago, with the rise of Salafism. In the modern world, the classical interpretation of Sunni orthodoxy, which sees in Sufism an essential dimension of Islam alongside the disciplines of jurisprudence and theology, is represented by institutions such as Egypt's Al Azhar University and Zaytuna College, with Al Azhar's current Grand Imam Ahmed El Tayeb recently defining Sunni orthodoxy as being a follower of any of the four schools of legal thought Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki or Hanbali and also of the Sufism of Imam Junaid of Baghdad in doctrines, manners and spiritual purification. Current Sufi orders include aliens, Bektashi order, Mevlivi order, Bar Alawiya, Chishti order, Jerahi, Naqsbandi, Mujadidi, Nimatullahi, Qadiriya, Kalandariya, Sawari Qadiriya, Shadhiliya, Sirwardiya, Saifiya, Naqsbandiya, and UIC. The relationship of Sufi orders to modern societies is usually defined by their relationship to governments. Turkey and Persia together have been a center for many Sufi lineages and orders. The Bektashi were closely affiliated with the Ottoman Janissaries and are the heart of Turkey's large and mostly liberal Alevi population. They have spread westwards to Cyprus, Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Republic of Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, and, more recently, to the United States, via Albania. Sufism is popular in such African countries as Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Senegal, where it is seen as a mystical expression of Islam. Sufism is traditional in Morocco, but has seen a growing revival with the renewal of Sufism under contemporary spiritual teachers such as Hamza al qadiri al-Bouchichi. Mbaki suggests that one reason Sufism has taken hold in Senegal is because it can accommodate local beliefs and customs, which tend toward the mystical. The life of the Algerian Sufi master Abdikader el jazeri is instructive in this regard. Notable as well are the lives of Amadou Bamba and Lhadj Umar Tall in West Africa, and Sheikh Mansa and Imam Shamil in the Caucasus. In the 20th century, some Muslims have called Sufism a superstitious religion which holds back Islamic achievement in the fields of science and technology. A number of Westerners have embarked with varying degrees of success on the path of Sufism. One of the first to return to Europe as an official representative of a Sufi order, and with the specific purpose to spread Sufism in Western Europe, was the Swedish-born wandering Sufi Ivan Agueli. René Ganon, the French scholar, became a Sufi in the early 20th century and was known as Sheikh Abdul Wahid Yahya. His manifold writings defined the practice of Sufism as the essence of Islam, but also pointed to the universality of its message. Other spiritualists, such as George Gurdjieff, may or may not conform to the tenets of Sufism as understood by Orthodox Muslims. Other noteworthy Sufi teachers who have been active in the West in recent years include Bawa Muhayyadeen, Anayat Khan, Nazim al Haqqani, Javad Nurbash, Bulent Raf, Irina Tweedy, Idris Shah, Muzaffar Ozak, Nahid Anga, and Ali Kayanfar. Currently active Sufi academics and publishers include Llewellyn Vaughan Lee, Nuh Ha Mim Keller, Abdullah Naruddin Durki, Wahid Ashraf, Omar Taran, Ahmed Abdur Rashid and Timothy Winter. <laughs> <laughs> Aims and objectives While all Muslims believe that they are on the pathway to Allah and hope to become close to God in Paradise, after death and after the last judgment, Sufis also believe that it is possible to draw closer to God and to more fully embrace the divine presence in this life. The chief aim of all Sufis is to seek the pleasing of God by working to restore within themselves the primordial state of fitra. To Sufis, the outer law consists of rules pertaining to worship, transactions, marriage, judicial rulings, and criminal law. What is often referred to, broadly, as canon. The inner law of Sufism consists of rules about repentance from sin, the purging of contemptible qualities and evil traits of character, and adornment with virtues and good character. Teachings To the Sufi, it is the transmission of divine light from the teacher's heart to the heart of the student, rather than worldly knowledge, that allows the adept to progress. They further believe that the teacher should attempt inerrantly to follow the divine law. According to Mujan Momin, one of the most important doctrines of Sufism is the concept of al-insan al-kamil, the perfect man. 
This doctrine states that there will always exist upon the Earth a Qutb. Pole or axis of the universe a man who is the perfect channel of grace from God to man and in a state of walaya sanctity, being under the protection of Allah. The concept of the Sufi Qutb is similar to that of the Shi'i Imam. However, this belief puts Sufism in direct conflict with Shia Islam, since both the Qutb who for most Sufi orders is the head of the order and the Imam fulfill the role of the purveyor of spiritual guidance and of Allah's grace to mankind. The vow of obedience to the Sheikh or Qutb which is taken by Sufis is considered incompatible with devotion to the Imam. As a further example, the prospective adherent of the Mevlevi order would have been ordered to serve in the kitchens of a hospice for the poor for 1,001 days prior to being accepted for spiritual instruction, and a further 1,001 days in solitary retreat as a precondition of completing that instruction. Some teachers, especially when addressing more general audiences, or mixed groups of Muslims and non-Muslims, make extensive use of parable, allegory, and metaphor. Although approaches to teaching vary among different Sufi orders, Sufism as a whole is primarily concerned with direct personal experience, and as such has sometimes been compared to other, non-Islamic forms of mysticism e.g., as in the books of Hossein Nasser. Many Sufi believe that to reach the highest levels of success in Sufism typically requires that the disciple live with and serve the teacher for a long period of time. An example is the folk story about Baha ud Din Naqsband Bukhari, who gave his name to the Naqsbandi order. He is believed to have served his first teacher, Sayyid Muhammad Baba as Samasi, for twenty years, until as Samasi died. He is said to then have served several other teachers for lengthy periods of time. He is said to have helped the poorer members of the community for many years and after this concluded his teacher directed him to care for animals cleaning their wounds, and assisting them. Muhammad Devotion to Muhammad is an exceptionally strong practice within Sufism. Sufis have historically revered Muhammad as the prime personality of spiritual greatness. The Sufi poet Saadi Shirazi stated, "...he who chooses a path contrary to that of the Prophet, shall never reach the destination." O Saadi, do not think that one can treat that way of purity except in the wake of the Chosen One. Rumi attributes his self-control and abstinence from worldly desires as qualities attained by him through the guidance of Muhammad. Rumi states, I sowed my two eyes shut from desires for this world and the next, this I learned from Muhammad." Ibn Arabi regards Muhammad as the greatest man and states, "...Muhammad's wisdom is uniqueness because he is the most perfect existent creature of this human species." For this reason, the command began with him and was sealed with him. He was a prophet while Adam was between water and clay, and his elemental structure is the seal of the prophets." Attar of Nishapur claimed that he praised Muhammad in such a manner that was not done before by any poet, in his book The Allahi Nama. Fariduddin Attar stated, "...Muhammad is the exemplar to both worlds, the guide of the descendants of Adam." He is the sun of creation, the moon of the celestial spheres, the all-seeing eye. The seven heavens and the eight gardens of paradise were created for him, he is both the eye and the light in the light of our eyes." Sufis have historically stressed the importance of Muhammad's perfection and his ability to intercede. The persona of Muhammad has historically been and remains an integral and critical aspect of Sufi belief and practice. Bayazid Bastami is recorded to have been so devoted to the Sunnah of Muhammad that he refused to eat a watermelon because he could not establish that Muhammad ever ate one. In the 13th century, a Sufi poet from Egypt, al Busiri, wrote the al Kawakib ad Duriya fi Mad Care al Bariya, the celestial lights in praise of the best of creation, commonly referred to as Kashidat al Burda, poem of the mantle, in which he extensively praised Muhammad. This poem is still widely recited and sung amongst Sufi groups all over the world. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Sufi beliefs about Muhammad. According to Ibn Arabi, Islam is the best religion because of Muhammad. 
Ibn Arabi regards that the first entity that was brought into existence is the reality or essence of Muhammad al al Ibn Arabi regards Muhammad as the supreme human being and master of all creatures. Muhammad is therefore the primary role model for human beings to aspire to emulate. Ibn Arabi believes that God's attributes and names are manifested in this world and that the most complete and perfect display of these divine attributes and names are seen in Muhammad. Ibn Arabi believes that one may see God in the mirror of Muhammad, meaning that the divine attributes of God are manifested through Muhammad. Ibn Arabi maintains that Muhammad is the best proof of God and by knowing Muhammad one knows God. Ibn Arabi also maintains that Muhammad is the master of all of humanity in both this world and the afterlife. In this view, Islam is the best religion, because Muhammad is Islam. Sufis maintain that Muhammad is al Insan al Kamal. Sufis believe that aid and support may be received from Muhammad, even today. Sufis believe that Muhammad listens to them when they call upon him. Sufis strive towards having a relationship with Muhammad and seeking to see Muhammad in a dream is a common Sufi practice. Sufism and Islamic law Sufis believe the sharia exoteric canon tariqa order and hakika truth are mutually interdependent Sufism leads the adept called salik or wayfarer in his salik or road through different stations makam until he reaches his goal the perfect tafid the existential confession that god is one Ibn Arabi says, "...when we see someone in this community who claims to be able to guide others to God, but is remiss in but one rule of the sacred law—even if he manifests miracles that stagger the mind—asserting that his shortcoming is a special dispensation for him, we do not even turn to look at him, for such a person is not a sheikh, nor is he speaking the truth, for no one is entrusted with the secrets of God Most High save one in whom the ordinances of the sacred law are preserved, Jamie Karamat al Aulia. The Aman Message, a detailed statement issued by 200 leading Islamic scholars in 2005 in Amman, specifically recognized the validity of Sufism as a part of Islam. This was adopted by the Islamic world's political and temporal leaderships at the organization of the Islamic Conference Summit at Mecca in December 2005, and by six other international Islamic scholarly assemblies including the International Islamic Fiqh Academy of Jeddah, in July 2006. The definition of Sufism can vary drastically between different traditions what may be intended is simple tazkiyah as opposed to the various manifestations of Sufism around the Islamic world. Topic. Traditional Islamic thought and Sufism The literature of Sufism emphasizes highly subjective matters that resist outside observation, such as the subtle states of the heart. Often these resist direct reference or description, with the consequence that the authors of various Sufi treatises took recourse to allegorical language. For instance, much Sufi poetry refers to intoxication, which Islam expressly forbids. This usage of indirect language and the existence of interpretations by people who had no training in Islam or Sufism led to doubts being cast over the validity of Sufism as a part of Islam. Also, some groups emerged that considered themselves above the Sharia and discussed Sufism as a method of bypassing the rules of Islam in order to attain salvation directly. This was disapproved of by traditional scholars. For these and other reasons, the relationship between traditional Islamic scholars and Sufism is complex and a range of scholarly opinion on Sufism in Islam has been the norm. Some scholars, such as al-Ghazali, helped its propagation while other scholars opposed it. William Chittick explains the position of Sufism and Sufis this way, in short, Muslim scholars who focused their energies on understanding the normative guidelines for the body came to be known as jurists, and those who held that the most important task was to train the mind in achieving correct understanding came to be divided into three main schools of thought, theology, philosophy, and Sufism. This leaves us with the third domain of human existence, the spirit. Most Muslims who devoted their major efforts to developing the spiritual dimensions of the human person came to be known as Sufis. Topic. Traditional and neo-Sufi groups 
The traditional Sufi orders, which are in majority, emphasize the role of Sufism as a spiritual discipline within Islam. Therefore, the Sharia traditional Islamic law and the Sunnah are seen as crucial for any Sufi aspirant. One proof traditional orders assert is that almost all the famous Sufi masters of the past caliphates were experts in Sharia and were renowned as people with great iman faith and excellent practice. Many were also Qadis Sharia law judges in courts. They held that Sufism was never distinct from Islam and to fully comprehend and practice Sufism one must be an observant Muslim. Neo-Sufism, Pseudo-Sufism, and Universal Sufism are terms used to denote modern, Western forms or appropriations of Sufism that do not require adherence to Sharia, or the Muslim faith. The terms are not always accepted by those it is applied to. For example, the Afghan Scottish teacher Idris Shah has been described as a neo-Sufi by the Gurdjieffian James Moore. The Sufi order in the West was founded by Anayat Khan, teaching the essential unity of all faiths, and accepting members of all creeds. Sufism reoriented is an offshoot of it charted by the syncretistic teacher Meher Baba. The Golden Sufi Center exists in England, Switzerland and the United States. It was founded by Llewellyn Vaughan Lee to continue the work of his teacher Irina Tweedy, herself a practitioner of both Hinduism and Neo-Sufism. Other Western Sufi organizations include the Sufi Foundation of America and the International Association of Sufism. Western Neo-Sufi practices may differ from traditional forms, for instance having mixed gender meetings and less emphasis on the Quran. Topic. Theoretical perspectives Traditional Islamic scholars have recognized two major branches within the practice of Sufism, and use this as one key to differentiating among the approaches of different masters and devotional lineages. On the one hand, there is the order from the signs to the signifier, or from the arts to the artisan. In this branch, the seeker begins by purifying the lower self of every corrupting influence that stands in the way of recognizing all of creation as the work of God, as God's active self-disclosure or theophany. This is the way of Imam al-Ghazali and of the majority of the Sufi orders. On the other hand, there is the order from the signifier to his signs, from the artisan to his works. In this branch the seeker experiences divine attraction jadba, and is able to enter the order with a glimpse of its endpoint, a direct apprehension of the divine presence towards which all spiritual striving is directed. This does not replace the striving to purify the heart, as in the other branch, it simply stems from a different point of entry into the path. This is the way primarily of the masters of the Naqshbandi and Shadhili orders. Contemporary scholars may also recognize a third branch, attributed to the late Ottoman scholar Said Nursi and explicated in his vast Quran commentary called the Risail Inur. This approach entails strict adherence to the way of Muhammad, in the understanding that this want, or sunnah, proposes a complete devotional spirituality adequate to those without access to a master of the Sufi way. Topic. Contributions to other domains of scholarship Sufism has contributed significantly to the elaboration of theoretical perspectives in many domains of intellectual endeavor. For instance, the doctrine of subtle centers or centers of subtle cognition known as Sitta addresses the matter of the awakening of spiritual intuition. In general, these subtle centers or latarif are thought of as faculties that are to be purified sequentially in order to bring the seeker's wayfaring to completion. A concise and useful summary of this system from a living exponent of this tradition has been published by Muhammad Emanur. Sufi psychology has influenced many areas of thinking both within and outside of Islam, drawing primarily upon three concepts. Jaffa al-Sadiq both an imam in the Shia tradition and a respected scholar and link in chains of Sufi transmission in all Islamic sects held that human beings are dominated by a lower self called the nafs self, ego, person, a faculty of spiritual intuition called the qalb heart, and ru soul. These interact in various ways, producing the spiritual types of the tyrant dominated by NAFS, the person of faith and moderation dominated by the spiritual heart, and the person lost in love for God dominated by the Rue. Of note with regard to the spread of Sufi psychology in the West is Robert Fraga, a Sufi teacher authorized in the Kalwati Jerahi order. 
Frager was a trained psychologist, born in the United States, who converted to Islam in the course of his practice of Sufism and wrote extensively on Sufism and psychology. Sufi cosmology and Sufi metaphysics are also noteworthy areas of intellectual accomplishment. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Devotional practices of Sufis. The devotional practices of Sufis vary widely. This is because an acknowledged and authorized master of the Sufi path is in effect a physician of the heart, able to diagnose the seeker's impediments to knowledge and pure intention in serving God, and to prescribe to the seeker a course of treatment appropriate to his or her maladies. The consensus among Sufi scholars is that the seeker cannot self-diagnose, and that it can be extremely harmful to undertake any of these practices alone and without formal authorization. Prerequisites to practice include rigorous adherence to Islamic norms, ritual prayer in its five prescribed times each day, the fast of Ramadan, and so forth. Additionally, the seeker ought to be firmly grounded in supererogatory practices known from the life of Muhammad, such as the Sunnah prayers. This is in accordance with the words, attributed to God, of the following, a famous hadith Qudsi My servant draws near to me through nothing I love more than that which I have made obligatory for him. My servant never ceases drawing near to me through supererogatory works until I love him. Then, when I love him, I am his hearing through which he hears, his sight through which he sees, his hand through which he grasps, and his foot through which he walks. It is also necessary for the seeker to have a correct creed akida, and to embrace with certainty its tenets. The seeker must also, of necessity, turn away from sins, love of this world, the love of company and renown, obedience to satanic impulse, and the promptings of the lower self. The way in which this purification of the heart is achieved is outlined in certain books, but must be prescribed in detail by a Sufi master. The seeker must also be trained to prevent the corruption of those good deeds which have accrued to his or her credit by overcoming the traps of ostentation, pride, arrogance, envy, and long hopes, meaning the hope for a long life allowing us to mend our ways later, rather than immediately, here and now. Sufi practices, while attractive to some, are not a means for gaining knowledge. The traditional scholars of Sufism hold it as absolutely axiomatic that knowledge of God is not a psychological state generated through breath control. Thus, practice of techniques is not the cause, but instead the occasion for such knowledge to be obtained, if at all, given proper prerequisites and proper guidance by a master of the way. Furthermore, the emphasis on practices may obscure a far more important fact, the seeker is, in a sense, to become a broken person, stripped of all habits through the practice of, in the words of Imam al-Ghazali, solitude, silence, sleeplessness, and hunger. Magic may have also been a part of some Sufi practices, notably in India. Dhikr Dhikr is the remembrance of Allah commanded in the Quran for all Muslims through a specific devotional act, such as the repetition of divine names, supplications and aphorisms from Hadith literature and the Quran. More generally, Dhikr takes a wide range and various layers of meaning. This includes Dhikr as any activity in which the Muslim maintains awareness of Allah. To engage in Dhikr is to practice consciousness of the Divine Presence and Love, or to seek a state of Godwariness. The Quran refers to Muhammad as the very embodiment of Dhikr of Allah 65 Some types of Dhikr are prescribed for all Muslims and do not require Sufi initiation or the prescription of a Sufi master because they are deemed to be good for every seeker under every circumstance. The Dhikr may slightly vary among each order. Some Sufi orders engage in ritualized Dhikr ceremonies, or Sema. Sema includes various forms of worship such as recitation, singing the most well known being the Qawwali music of the Indian subcontinent, instrumental music, dance most famously the Sufi whirling of the Mevlevi order, incense, meditation, ecstasy, and trance. Some Sufi orders stress and place extensive reliance upon Dhikr. This practice of Dhikr is called Dhikr e Kulb, invocation of Allah within the heartbeats. The basic idea in this practice is to visualize the Allah as having been written on the disciple's heart. Topic: <laughs> Marakaba. 
The practice of Marakaba can be likened to the practices of meditation attested in many faith communities. While variation exists, one description of the practice within a Naxpandi lineage reads as follows. He is to collect all of his bodily senses in concentration, and to cut himself off from all preoccupation and notions that inflict themselves upon the heart. And thus he is to turn his full consciousness towards God Most High while saying three times, Allahi anta maksudi wa ridika matlabai. My God, you are my goal and your good pleasure is what I seek. Then he brings to his heart the name of the essence Allah. And as it courses through his heart he remains attentive to its meaning, which is, "...essence without likeness." The seeker remains aware that he is present, watchful, encompassing of all, thereby exemplifying the meaning of his saying, "...may God bless him and grant him peace. Worship God as though you see him, for if you do not see him, he sees you." And likewise the prophetic tradition. The most favored level of faith is to know that God is witness over you, wherever you may be. Sufi whirling Sufi whirling or Sufi spinning is a form of sama or physically active meditation which originated among Sufis, and which is still practiced by the Sufi dervishes of the Mevlevi order. It is a customary dance performed within the Sema, through which dervishes also called Samazans, from Persian Smazan aim to reach the source of all perfection, or Kamal. This is sought through abandoning one's nafs, egos or personal desires, by listening to the music, focusing on God, and spinning one's body in repetitive circles, which has been seen as a symbolic imitation of planets in the solar system orbiting the sun as explained by Sufis. In the symbolism of the Sema ritual, the Samazan's camel's hair hat represents the tombstone of the ego, his wide, white skirt tenure represents the ego's shroud. By removing his black cloak herka, he is spiritually reborn to the truth. At the beginning of the Sema, by holding his arms crosswise, the Samazan appears to represent the number one, thus testifying to God's unity. While whirling, his arms are open, his right arm is directed to the sky, ready to receive God's beneficence, his left hand, upon which his eyes are fastened, is turned toward the earth. The Samazan conveys God's spiritual gift to those who are witnessing the Sema. Revolving from right to left around the heart, the Samazan embraces all humanity with love. The human being has been created with love in order to love. Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi says, all loves are a bridge to divine love. Yet, those who have not had a taste of it do not know. <laughs> Music Kawali is a form of Sufi devotional music popular in South Asia, usually performed at dargahs. Sufi saint Amir Khusro is said to have infused Persian, Arabic Turkish and Indian classical musical styles to create the genre in the 13th century. The songs are classified into Hamd, Na, Mankabat, Marcia or Ghazal, among others. The songs lasting for about 15 to 30 minutes, are performed by a group of singers, and instruments including the harmonium, tabla and dolak are used. Pakistani singing maestro Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan is credited with popularizing Qawwali all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Saints Wali Arabic, vli plural oli olia is an Arabic word whose literal meanings include custodian, protector, helper, and friend. In the vernacular, it is most commonly used by Muslims to indicate an Islamic saint, otherwise referred to by the more literal friend of God. In the traditional Islamic understanding of saints, the saint is portrayed as someone marked by special divine favor and holiness and who is specifically chosen by God and endowed with exceptional gifts, such as the ability to work miracles." The doctrine of saints was articulated by Islamic scholars very early on in Muslim history, and particular verses of the Quran and certain hadith were interpreted by early Muslim thinkers as documentary evidence of the existence of saints. 
Since the first Muslim hagiographies were written during the period when Sufism began its rapid expansion, many of the figures who later came to be regarded as the major saints in Sunni Islam were the early Sufi mystics, like Hassan of Basra d. 728, Farqad Sabaki d. 729, Dawood Tai d. 777 to 81, Rabi al Adoria d. 801, Marakaki d. 815, and Junarid of Baghdad d. 910. From the 12th to the 14th century, the general veneration of saints, among both people and sovereigns, reached its definitive form with the organization of Sufism into orders or brotherhoods. In the common expressions of Islamic piety of this period, the saint was understood to be a contemplative whose state of spiritual perfection found permanent expression in the teaching bequeathed to his disciples. Topic. Visitation In popular Sufism i.e. devotional practices that have achieved currency in world cultures through Sufi influence, one common practice is to visit or make pilgrimages to the tombs of saints, renowned scholars, and righteous people. This is a particularly common practice in South Asia, where famous tombs include such saints as Sayyid Ali Hamadani in Kulob, Tajikistan, Afak Koya, near Kashgar, China, Lal Shabazz Kalanda in Sindh, Ali Hajwari in Lahore, Pakistan, Bavaldan Zikriya in Multan Pakistan, Moinuddin Chishti in Ajma, India, Nizamuddin Aulia in Delhi, India, and Shah Jalal in Salet, Bangladesh. Likewise, in Fez, Morocco, a popular destination for such pious visitation is the Zawiya Moulay Idris II and the yearly visitation to see the current Sheikh of the Qadiri Bouchichi Tarakar, Sheikh Sidi Hamza al-Qadiri al-Bouchichi to celebrate the Maulid which is usually televised on Moroccan national television. Miracles <inaudible> 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 In Islamic mysticism, karamat Arabic, kramat karamat, place of cramped karama, lit. Generosity, high-mindedness refers to supernatural wonders performed by Muslim saints. In the technical vocabulary of Islamic religious sciences, the singular form karama has a sense similar to charism, a favor or spiritual gift freely bestowed by God. The marvels ascribed to Islamic saints have included supernatural physical actions, predictions of the future, and interpretation of the secrets of hearts." Historically, a "...belief in the miracles of saints literally marvels of the friends of God," has been a requirement in Sunni Islam. <laughs> Persecution Persecution of Sufis and Sufism has included destruction of Sufi shrines and mosques, suppression of orders, and discrimination against adherents in a number of Muslim-majority countries. The Turkish Republican state banned all Sufi orders and abolished their institutions in 1925 after Sufis opposed the new secular order. The Iranian Islamic Republic has harassed Shia Sufis, reportedly for their lack of support for the government doctrine of "...governance of the jurist." i.e., that the supreme Shiite jurist should be the nation's political leader. In most other Muslim countries, attacks on Sufis and especially their shrines have come from Salafis who believe that practices such as celebration of the birthdays of Sufi saints, and dhikr remembrance of God ceremonies are bitter or impure innovation, and polytheistic shirk. .At least 305 people were killed and more than 100 wounded during a November 2017 attack on a mosque in Sinai. Topic. Prominent Sufis Topic. Abdul Qadir Gilani Abdul Qadir Gilani was a Persian Hanbali jurist and Sufi based in Baghdad. Qadiriya was his patronym. Gilani spent his early life in Naif, the town of his birth. There, he pursued the study of Hanbali law. Abu Sayyid Mubarak Makhzomi gave Gilani lessons in fiqh. He was given lessons about hadith by Abu Bakr ibn Muzaffa. He was given lessons about tafsir by Abu Muhammad Jaffa, a commentator. 
His Sufi spiritual instructor was Abul Qair Hamid ibn Muslim al Dabbas. After completing his education, Gilani left Baghdad. He spent 25 years as a reclusive wanderer in the desert regions of Iraq. In 1127, Gilani returned to Baghdad and began to preach to the public. He joined the teaching staff of the school belonging to his own teacher, Abu Sayyid Mubarak Makhzomi, and was popular with students. In the morning he taught hadith and tafsir, and in the afternoon he held discourse on the science of the heart and the virtues of the Quran. Abul Hassan Ash Shadhili Abul Hassan Ash Shadhili died 1258, the founder of the Shadhiliya order, introduced Dhikr Jari the remembrance of God out loud, as opposed to the silent Dhikr. He taught that his followers need not abstain from what Islam has not forbidden, but to be grateful for what God has bestowed upon them, in contrast to the majority of Sufis, who preach to deny oneself and to destroy the ego self NAFS, order of patience. Tarikas Sabr, Shadhiliya is formulated to be order of gratitude. Tarikish Shuka. Imam Shadhili also gave 18 valuable hesps litanies to his followers out of which the notable hesp al-bar is recited worldwide even today. <laughs> Ahmad al-Tajani Ahmad al-Tajani Abu al-Abbas Ahmad ibn Muhammad at Tajani or Ahmed Tajani (1735–1815) in Arabic city armed Aljani (City Ahmed Tajani) is the founder of the Tijaniya Sufi order. He was born in a Berber family in An Madi, present-day Algeria, and died in Fez, Morocco, at the age of 80. Topic: <laughs> Bayazid Bastami. Bayazid Bastami is a very well recognized and influential Sufi personality. Bastami was born in 804 in Bastam. Bayazid is regarded for his devout commitment to the Sunnah and his dedication to fundamental Islamic principles and practices. Bawa Muhayyadeen Bawa Muhayyadeen died 1986 is a Sufi sheikh from Sri Lanka. He was first found by a group of religious pilgrims in the early 1900s meditating in the jungles of Kataragama in Sri Lanka Ceylon. Awed and inspired by his personality and the depth of his wisdom, he was invited to a nearby village. Since that time, people of all walks of life from paupers to prime ministers belonging to all religious and ethnic backgrounds have flocked to see Sheikh Bawa Muhayyadeen to seek comfort, guidance and help. Sheikh Bawa Muhayyadeen tirelessly spent the rest of his life preaching, healing and comforting the many souls that came to see him. <laughs> Ibn Arabi Mahayyadin Muhammad B. Ali ibn Arabi or Ibn al Arabi are 561 R 638, July 28, 1165 to November 10, 1240, is considered to be one of the most important Sufi masters, although he never founded any order. Tariqa. His writings, especially al Futurat al Makiyah and Fusus al Hikam, have been studied within all the Sufi orders as the clearest expression of tafid divine unity, though because of their recondite nature they were often only given to initiates. Later, those who followed his teaching became known as the school of Wadat al Wujud. The oneness of being. He himself considered his writings to have been divinely inspired. As he expressed the way to one of his close disciples, his legacy is that you should never ever abandon your servanthood ubajia, and that there may never be in your soul a longing for any existing thing. <laughs> Junarid of Baghdad Junarid of Baghdad was one of the great early Sufis. His order was Junaidiyah, which links to the golden chain of many Sufi orders. He laid the groundwork for sober mysticism in contrast to that of God-intoxicated Sufis like Al-Halij, Bayazid Bastami and Abusid Abulkair. During the trial of Al-Halij, his former disciple, the Caliph of the time demanded his fatwa. In response, he issued this fatwa. 
from the outward appearance he is to die and we judge according to the outward appearance and God knows better." He is referred to by Sufis as Sayyid ut taifa i.e., the leader of the group. He lived and died in the city of Baghdad. <laughs> Mansa al-Halij Mansur al-Halij is renowned for his claim, Anna lhaqq, I am the truth. His refusal to recant this utterance, which was regarded as apostasy, led to a long trial. He was imprisoned for eleven years in a Baghdad prison, before being tortured and publicly dismembered on March 26, 922. He is still revered by Sufis for his willingness to embrace torture and death rather than recant. It is said that during his prayers, he would say, O oh Lord! You are the guide of those who are passing through the Valley of Bewilderment. If I am a heretic, enlarge my heresy. Moinuddin Chishti Kwaya Moinuddin Chishti was born in 1141 and died in 1236. Also known as Garib Nawaz. Benefactor of the poor. He is the most famous Sufi saint of the Chishti order. Moinuddin Chishti introduced and established the order in the Indian subcontinent. The initial spiritual chain or silsila of the Chishti order in India, comprising Moinuddin Chishti, Bhaktiar Khaki, Baba Farid, Nizamuddin Aulia, each successive person being the disciple of the previous one, constitutes the great Sufi saints of Indian history. Moinuddin Chishti turned towards India, reputedly after a dream in which Muhammad blessed him to do so. After a brief stay at Lahore, he reached Ajmer along with Sultan Shahab ud Din Muhammad Ghori, and settled down there. In Ajmer, he attracted a substantial following, acquiring a great deal of respect amongst the residents of the city. Moinuddin Chishti practiced the Sufi Sul Ekul concept to promote understanding between Muslims and non-Muslims. <inaudible> Rabia al Adoria Rabia al or Rabia of Basra died 801 was a mystic who represents countercultural elements of Sufism, especially with regards to the status and power of women. Prominent Sufi leader Hassan of Basra is said to have castigated himself before her superior merits and sincere virtues. Rabia was born either a slave or a servant of very poor origin, released by her master when he awoke one night to see the light of sanctity shining above her head. Rabia al Adoria is known for her teachings and emphasis on the centrality of the love of God to a holy life. She is said to have proclaimed, running down the streets of Basra, Iraq, O oh God! If I worship you for fear of hell, burn me in hell, and if I worship you in hope of paradise, exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you for your own sake, grudge me not your everlasting beauty. She died in Jerusalem and is thought to have been buried in the Chapel of the Ascension. Shrines Adaga Persian, Dagadaga or Drodaga, also in Urdu, is a shrine built over the grave of a revered religious figure, often a Sufi saint or dervish. Sufis often visit the shrine for zirat, a term associated with religious visits and pilgrimages. Dargahs are often associated with Sufi eating and meeting rooms and hostels, called kankar or hospices. They usually include a mosque, meeting rooms, Islamic religious schools madrasas, residences for a teacher or caretaker, hospitals, and other buildings for community purposes. Major Sufi orders The term tariqa is used for a school or order of Sufism, or especially for the mystical teaching and spiritual practices of such an order with the aim of seeking haqiqah ultimate truth. A tariqa has a murshid guide who plays the role of leader or spiritual director. The members or followers of a tariqa are known as muridin singular murid, meaning desirous, viz. Desiring the knowledge of knowing God and loving God. Topic: <inaudible> Bektashi. 
The Bektashi order was founded in the 13th century by the Islamic Saint Haji Bektash Veli, and greatly influenced during its formulative period by the Harafi Ali al Ayla in the 15th century and reorganized by Balam Sultan in the 16th century. Chishti The Chishti order Persian, Shti was founded by Kawaha Abu Ishaq Shami, the Syrian, died 941, who brought Sufism to the town of Chisht, some 95 miles east of Herat in present-day Afghanistan. Before returning to the Levant, Shami initiated, trained and deputized the son of the local emir Quayar, Abu Ahmad Abdal died 966. Under the leadership of Abu Ahmad's descendants, the Chishia as they are also known, flourished as a regional mystical order. Kubrawiya The Kubrawiya order is a Sufi order tariqa", named after its 13th century founder Najmuddin Kubra. The Kubrawiya Sufi order was founded in the 13th century by Najmuddin Kubra in Bukhara in modern Uzbekistan. The Mongols had captured Bukhara in 1221, they committed genocide and killed nearly the whole population. Sheikh Nadjm Ed Din Kubra was among those killed by the Mongols. Morloya <inaudible> <inaudible> The Mevlevi order is better known in the West as the Whirling Dervishes. Muradaya Mouride is a large Islamic Sufi order most prominent in Senegal and the Gambia, with headquarters in the holy city of Touba, Senegal. Naxbandi The Naxbandi order is one of the major Sufi orders of Islam, previously known as Siddiqia as the order stems from Muhammad through Abu Bakr as Siddiq. It is considered by some to be a soba order known for its silent dhikr remembrance of God rather than the vocalized forms of dhikr common in other orders. The word Naxbandi Nikshbandi is Persian, taken from the name of the founder of the order, Baha ud din Naxband Bukhari. Some have said that the translation means, "...related to the image maker." Some also consider it to mean, "...pattern maker," rather than, "...image maker," and interpret, "...naxbandi," to mean, "...reformer of patterns," and others consider it to mean, "...way of the chain," or, "...silsila al-Dahab." <laughs> The Nimatullahi order is the most widespread Sufi order of Persia today. It was founded by Shah Nimatullah Wali died 1367, established and transformed from his inheritance of the Marufiya circle. There are several suborders in existence today, the most known and influential in the West following the lineage of Dr. Javad Nurbash who brought the order to the West following the 1979 revolution in Iran. Kadiri The Kadiri order is one of the oldest Sufi orders. It derives its name from Abdul Qadir Gilani a native of the Iranian province of Gilan. The order is one of the most widespread of the Sufi orders in the Islamic world, and has a huge presence in Central Asia, Pakistan, Turkey, Balkans and much of East and West Africa. The Qadiriya have not developed any distinctive doctrines or teachings outside of mainstream Islam. They believe in the fundamental principles of Islam, but interpreted through mystical experience. Senusi Senusi is a religious political Sufi order established by Muhammad ibn Ali as Senusi. Muhammad ibn Ali as Senussi founded this movement due to his criticism of the Egyptian ulama. Originally from Mecca, as Senussi left due to pressure from Wahhabis to leave and settled in Cyrenaica where he was well received. Idris bin Muhammad al-Mahdi as Senussi was later recognized as Emir of Cyrenaica and eventually became King of Libya. 
The monarchy was abolished by Muammar Gaddafi but, a third of Libyans still claim to be Senussi. Shadhiliya The Shadhili is a Sufi order founded by Abu el Hassan ash Shadhili. Ikhwans murids, followers of the Shadhiliya are often known as Shadhilis. Fasiya, a branch of Shadhiliya founded by Imam al Fasi of Makkah, is the widely practiced Sufi order in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Malaysia, Singapore, Mauritius, Indonesia, and other Middle East countries. Topic: Surawardia. The Surawardia order (Arabic: Shrudit) is a Sufi order founded by Abu al-Najib al-Surawardi (1097–1168). The order was formalized by his nephew Shahab al-Din Abu Hjf Sumar Surawardi. Topic: Tijaniya. The Tijaniya order attach a large importance to culture and education, and emphasize the individual adhesion of the disciple murid. <inaudible> <inaudible> Symbols associated with the Sufi orders <inaudible> Reception Topic. Perception outside Islam Sufi mysticism has long exercised a fascination upon the Western world, and especially its Orientalist scholars. Figures like Rumi have become well known in the United States, where Sufism is perceived as a peaceful and apolitical form of Islam. Orientalists have proposed a variety of diverse theories pertaining to the nature of Sufism, such as it being influenced by Neoplatonism or as an Aryan historical reaction against Semitic cultural influence. Hossein Nasser states that the preceding theories are false according to the point of view of Sufism. The Islamic Institute in Mannheim, Germany, which works towards the integration of Europe and Muslims, sees Sufism as particularly suited for interreligious dialogue and intercultural harmonization in democratic and pluralist societies. It has described Sufism as a symbol of tolerance and humanism non dogmatic, flexible, and non violent. According to Philip Jenkins, a professor at Baylor University, the Sufis are much more than tactical allies for the West, they are, potentially, the greatest hope for pluralism and democracy within Muslim nations." Likewise, several governments and organizations have advocated the promotion of Sufism as a means of combating intolerant and violent strains of Islam. For example, the Chinese and Russian governments openly favor Sufism as the best means of protecting against Islamist subversion. The British government, especially following the 7th of July 2005 London bombings, has favored Sufi groups in its battle against Muslim extremist currents. The influential Rand Corporation, an American think tank, issued a major report titled Building Moderate Muslim Networks, which urged the US government to form links with and bolster Muslim groups that opposed Islamist extremism. The report stressed the Sufi role as moderate traditionalists open to change, and thus as allies against violence. News organizations such as the BBC, Economist and Boston Globe have also seen Sufism as a means to deal with violent Muslim extremists. Idris Shah states that Sufism is universal in nature, its roots predating the rise of Islam and Christianity. He quotes Sir Wardi as saying that this Sufism was a form of wisdom known to and practiced by a succession of sages including the mysterious ancient Hermes of Egypt," and that Ibn al farid "...stresses that Sufism lies behind and before systematization, that our wine existed before what you call the grape and the vine the school and the system." Shah's views have however been rejected by modern scholars. Such modern trends of neo-Sufis in Western countries allow non-Muslims to receive instructions on following the Sufi path, not without opposition by Muslims who consider such instruction outside the sphere of Islam. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Influence on Judaism. Both Judaism and Islam are monotheistic. 
there is evidence that Sufism did influence the development of some schools of Jewish philosophy and ethics. In the first writing of this kind, we see Kitab al Hidayah ila Farid al Kalab, Duties of the Heart, of Bayar ibn Pakuda. This book was translated by Judah ibn Tibbon into Hebrew under the title, Hobot ha Lababit. The precepts prescribed by the Torah number 613 only, those dictated by the intellect are innumerable. It is noteworthy that in the ethical writings of the Sufis al Qusajri and al Harawi there are sections which treat of the same subjects as those treated in the Hovat ha Lababit and which bear the same titles, e.g., Bab al Tawakal, Bab al Tauba, Bab al Mahazabah, Bab al Tawadu, Bab al Zuhd. In the Ninth Gate, Baya directly quotes sayings of the Sufis, whom he calls Perashim. However, the author of the Hobot Hala Babbit did not go so far as to approve of the asceticism of the Sufis, although he showed a marked predilection for their ethical principles. Abraham ben Moses ben Maimon, the son of the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, believed that Sufi practices and doctrines continue the tradition of the biblical prophets. See Sefer Hamaspik, Haparisheth, Chapter 11, Har Mma Abik. S. V. Hithbon Nefo B. Masorath Muflazo, citing the Talmudic explanation of Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 27 in Chajigar 5b, in Rabbi Yaakov Winselberg's translation, The Way of Serving God. Feldheim, p. 429 and above, p. 427. Also see Ibad, chapter 10, Itgubim. S. V. W. A. Halo Yoda Arata, in The Way of Serving God. P. 371. Abraham Maimouni's principal work is originally composed in Judeo Arabic and entitled, Kashan Kapi Poundan, Kitab Kifaya al Abidin, a comprehensive guide for the servants of God. From the extant surviving portion, it is conjectured that Maimouni's treatise was three times as long as his father's guide for the perplexed. In the book, Maimouni evidences a great appreciation for, and affinity to, Sufism. Followers of his path continued to foster a Jewish Sufi form of pietism for at least a century, and he is rightly considered the founder of this pietistic school, which was centered in Egypt. The followers of this path, which they called, interchangeably, Hasidism not to be confused with the later Jewish Hasidic movement or Sufism Tasawwuf, practiced spiritual retreats, solitude, fasting and sleep deprivation. The Jewish Sufis maintained their own brotherhood, guided by a religious leader, like a Sufi sheikh. Topic in popular culture. Topic music. In 2005, Rabbi Shergal released a Sufi rock song called Bula Ki Jana, which became a chart topper in India and Pakistan. Topic. Literature The 13th century Persian poet Rumi, is considered one of the most influential figures of Sufism, as well as one of the greatest poets of all time. He has become one of the most widely read poets in the United States, thanks largely to the interpretative translations published by Coleman Barks. Elif Safak's novel The Forty Rules of Love is a fictionalized account of Rumi's encounter with the Persian dervish Shams Tabrizi. Alama Iqbal, one of the greatest Urdu poets, has discussed Sufism, philosophy, and Islam in his English work The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. <laughs> Gallery Topic. See also Index of Sufism-related articles List of modern Sufi scholars List of Sufi saints World Sufi Forum Tawasul Tazkaya Baraka Ash'ari Maturidi 2016 International Conference on Sunni Islam in Grozny Gulen Movement <laughs>